Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's Tech Talk. My name is Calum, and today I'm going to be going over um, the OpenFire chat server. I'm going to talk about what it is, how to set it up, and then how to connect to it, and uh, also go over some use cases where um, the OpenFire chat server might be used. First, we're going to talk about the protocol itself. Um, it's based on the XMPP protocol, which is a very widely used uh, protocol. It uh, stands for the Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. Uh, it used to be called Jabber. Um, nowadays, it is XMPP. Jabber is actually a specific product uh, put out by Cisco, so they are different. Uh, it's used in a million and one different uh, platforms. It's used for instant messaging, presence information, and then you can do contact lists and things like that. It is based on XML, which is the extensible markup language, and it enables re near real-time exchange of structured data between two or more network entities. Um, this is a really, really lightweight um, protocol. So if you have a situation where you are very limited on bandwidth, or um, even if you're using dial-up or something worse, uh, certain satellite communications uh, transports um, sometimes can be really horrible. XMPP does really good with working through all of that. So the first thing we're going to do is um, talk about how to get it installed. Um, so first you're going to need to download um, the source files. And um, I'm going to jump over here real quick to our web page here. All right, so if you just uh, jump into Google and type in OpenFire chat server, you will see um, Ignite Real Time pops up right here, OpenFire. And when you click on that, it's going to bring you to their website. The third tab over here is the Downloads uh, tab, which is where we're going to go to get all of our, um, all of our uh, installers and whatnot. Um, there's a bunch of information here on the website. There's readmes and there's a community. So if you have issues, you can reach out and ask them. Uh, we're going to click on downloads and as you can see here the first one is the openfire 4.7.4 installer this is the server okay if you click on windows or linux or whichever platform you're installing onto uh, it gives you a couple of download options you have a 32-bit a 64-bit and a zip option um, in addition you also get the spark client now, there are many different chat clients that will work with an OpenFire server as long as they are XMPP capable, which most are. So, uh, I've already downloaded uh, both of these. Um, and we're going to look at the actual installation process. Um, just uh, real quick before we continue, there are a couple of use cases. Um, so, if you are... A, IT administrator uh, for a small business, uh, this particular uh, server or chat solution would work really well for you. Um, and it actually is pretty scalable. So even if you have a larger environment that you're providing chat services for, um, this is a good solution. It is an open source solution. So um, it is free. There's no licensing requirement. You can um, basically use it how you will. Um, and one more thing as far as um, kind of a caveat or a requirement for OpenFire, you do need to use Java to make it work. Uh, the backend is based on Java. And I know a lot of companies and uh, some military organizations um, prefer not to use Java because of the security uh, concerns or implications. So if for whatever reason you're unable to use Java in your environment, then OpenFire is not going to be the solution for you. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is basic host setup. Um, I have a VM set up right now um, that we're going to be using to walk through this. And um, we're basically going to go through, set up a computer name, an IP address, and test connectivity. Before you start uh, installing the server itself, you're going to want to make sure you have a good um, you know, machine to install it on. Um, for my walkthrough example, I'm going to be using um, a Microsoft server install. You can also install this on just a like a Windows 10 client or a laptop or a desktop computer. Um, but for this example, I'm going to be using uh, an actual server. So 
Let's get into it. Let me log in here. Okay, good. I do remember my password. That's that's always a good start. Okay, so um, this is basically just an evaluation copy of uh, Microsoft Server. Um, I haven't done anything to it. I deployed it from a template that I have set up just for demos and things. So you can see I already have uh, VM tools installed down here in the bottom right. Uh, the first thing we're going to want to look at is computer name. You always want to have a good... Uh, Good computer name. Everybody has different standards, uh, so make sure you, you match your corporate standard or your policy standard. Um, but we want to name it before we get started so we don't forget. And again, anytime you change the computer name or uh, add it or remove it from a domain, there is a restart that's required. We're just going to name this guy OpenFire01. Uh, you can add this to the domain, um, or you can leave it standalone, even if you're in a domain environment. Um, you know, there's a couple of considerations there that are outside the scope of this video. I'm going to go ahead and kick that restart real quick. Um, so if you are running a, an Active Directory domain, and you want to add this to your domain so that all the group policy and security settings and things like that apply, um, that is fine that you do that. Um, you can Active Directory integrate your OpenFire server without adding it to the domain, uh, or you can leave it as a standalone. Um, and I'll talk about some of the pros and cons of those um, a little bit later. But really the upfront is um, if you don't Active Directory integrate, anytime you want to create a user or a new chat room or something like that, you're going to have to actually log into OpenFire to do that. Um, so it's a little bit less scalable, but if you're in a small branch um, office environment or home use or, or something small, um, you can get away with that. If you're planning on scaling up, though, um, I highly recommend that you Active Directory integrate it. Whether or not you join it to the domain, like I said, doesn't really matter, but um, it makes it easier to manage users if you are Active Directory integrated. All right, it looks like that is back up. So the next step is going to be to uh, assign it an IP address and then check connectivity. So we're going to log back into the server, which has now been renamed. We're going to jump in here to the uh, network, assign that IP address, and test connectivity. And then we'll move on to the next step. Looks like it's going a little slow this morning. Every day is a Monday for computers, so we'll just have to battle through it. Okay, so I'm going to get in here. I have a separate VLAN set up for demos, um, so I'm going to just assign it an IP address in here. So uh, dot one is going to be my gateway, dot two is going to be my server, and then when we do the client video, that's going to be dot three. And then I'm going to point it at my DNS. Um, now, if you're setting this up just on a LAN, you don't necessarily need to have a um, default gateway or any DNS or anything like that. But um, if you do have it, it makes it easier to do, you know, name resolution and then cross over into other networks. We'll let that identify. It looks like it did, uh, it was able to talk to the gateway and or DNS. So we're going to open up a command prompt and verify that we can actually um, get out of our local subnet. Now, in my um, client demonstration, which will be in a different video, um, we are going to actually be in the same subnet. But this software works just fine if you're, you know, crossing uh, subnet boundaries. All right, and we can ping our DNS server, so that is excellent. Okay, so now we have a server that has a host name configured, an IP address assigned, and it does have connectivity um, inside and outside our local subnet.
Now, as I mentioned before, you do need uh, Java in order to, uh, to run the OpenFire server. So if you don't have a copy of Java, um, just like we did with the OpenFire server, run out to uh, Google, type in uh, Java installer or Java download, and you'll be able to get a copy of that. All right, so the next step is going to be install OpenFire. Um, we're going to jump back over to our server. And we're just, uh, the first step is we're going to pull down all of the installers that I've already pre-staged. Let's see if name resolution works here. Well, apparently it is not working, but that's okay. We know the IP. Okay, so as you can see in this little share that I, I set up for this demonstration, um, we have the Java installer, the OpenFire server, and then Spark, which is one of the, um, the clients that I showed you on the OpenFire download page. We're not going to be installing the client on this machine, so we're just going to copy over the prereq, the Java installer, and the OpenFire. Um, I did download the standalone or offline installers for both of these, so we don't actually even need an internet connection. So if you're in an air-gapped environment or you plan on doing this in an air-gapped environment, uh, make sure you download the offline installers because um, the default download option will just be a lightweight little widget that will download the actual stuff for you. Um, if you're in an air-gapped environment, obviously that will not work. All right, usually Java installs pretty quickly. We'll give that a moment to install, and then we'll move on to the OpenFire installation. And just like that, we have Java installed. Okay, the next step, uh, I don't, it did not ask for a restart, um, and I don't think a restart is necessary for the installation of OpenFire, so we're just gonna roll with it and see if it works. Um, I've used OpenFire, I've installed it many times before. Uh, I have not done it in quite some time. So uh, these are actually different versions of Java, of OpenFire, and Spark. So th there may be some issues that I run into um, that I've not experienced before, and then we'll just, we'll just walk through those and, and get through it together. So we're going to go through the basic install menus for OpenFire. Um, very straightforward for the install, and then there is um, an initial configuration phase that takes place after the install. Um, that's a little bit more involved, and we'll cover that in just a moment. Okay, it's asking us to start the OpenFire service. If you uncheck this, then it's, um, it's going to disable the service. Uh, in the um, actual operating system services window. Uh, if you start it, then it's going to run OpenFire every time the machine restarts. And then all of the configurations and whatnot take place via a um, kind of a web-based uh, interface. So um, that is something too to be considered on server, and I don't know if we're going to have this issue this time around, but... Um, If you have the enhanced, uh, there you go, the enhanced uh, security configured on um, on your server, it might uh, create some some issues for you. Actually, let me close this. I think this is flagging for the the second window. Let me just close this one because that one doesn't matter. Okay, here we go. So it did open. We didn't have to do anything crazy with the um, internet settings or or anything like that. So it brought me to setup which brings us to our next chapter uh, so open fire is installed uh, the next step is to do the initial setup so obviously uh, you're going to pick the appropriate language for me that is english It's going to ask for the XMPP domain name and server host name. Uh, this should be 
uh, well, the server host name, if it's if you're joining it to the domain or if this server is joined to the domain, you're going to type in the fully qualified domain name. Um, because I'm not joining the server to the domain, uh, you can just leave it as the host name. If you want to modify the default admin console port or secure um, admin console port, you can change those here. You can also, if you choose, modify the um, encryption type here. Um, I tend, tend to leave it just as the default. And uh, also note in here, there's uh, little question bubbles next to every field. So if you have questions about any of the things that's going on here, um, you can mouse over that or click on it and get more information. I'm not going to configure a property encryption key. I'm just going to click Next. All right, I'm going to see if adding this prevents that window from popping up every time. Let's see, I'm going to click Continue. Oh, apparently I did a, uh, I dropped an asterisk in the, in the host name. Okay, first mistake. Let me remove that and click Next again. Okay. So here you have the option to uh, use a standard database connection um, using an external database with built-in connection uh, pool. Um, this is if you would be if, if you already have a SQL server or some some sort of database server set up on a different machine, you can point the chat database to that. Or in my case, uh, you can use an embedded database where it will keep everything local to the server. If you're really trying to scale this large, you're going to want to use an external SQL or uh, external database solution. So this is a first important decision point. Are we going to store users and groups in the server database locally? Um, it says right there, this is the best option for simple deployments. Or are we going to want to do Active Directory integration? So I do have um, an Active Directory server set up, but I'm not going to demonstrate that just yet. If you're looking to do a small simple deployment um, like I'm like I'm demonstrating now um, that'll be the best option I will cover how to Active Directory integrate here shortly so here it asks for an admin email address it says a valid email address for the admin account um, this isn't strictly necessary but what is important is uh, I mean when I say it's not strictly necessary, this doesn't necessarily have to be a valid email address. It, it, like there's no, they're not going to send you an email with a link that you have to verify or anything like that. Um, this is just an email address that will be presented to users in case, you know, they need admin help or something like that. So we're going to pick a password. And then we are going to click continue. So, okay, and that's it. So initial setup is complete. Um, now we can log into the admin console. So that username that um, or the admin email address that we set up um, should be entered here. And as embarrassing as this is, I didn't actually look at what it was. It was admin at something. So let's see if you need the domain to actually log in. Okay, good, you don't. So whatever that, um, whatever the first part of that email address is, is going to be what your uh, admin credential is to get in here. And then you can add others. So every time you log in to your OpenFire server, um, this is where it's going to kind of land you. Uh, it gives you recent events, what's been going on. It gives you the memory that Java is using to host the server. It tells you how long it's been up and uh, kind of just some basic information. So we're going to go through kind of all of these and just walk through it. Next step is uh, server properties. This is the configuration file, um, which is actually just a local, um, like, uh, text file that's embedded into the install, but you can do modification to it from here, which is kind of nice. Then you can set the language and the time. You can set up um, clustering. 
I'm not going to do that, but if you have a, um, I guess, a large deployment or you need, um, you know, a really small amount of downtime or you're in a no downtime situation, you might want to consider clustering. All right, there's the cache summary, the database information. You can query statistics to see how often that's, um, or what the statistics for the server itself are. Um, there's logs, email settings, as well as SMS, and then there's a security audit page here. The next tab is uh, server settings, right? So if we decided we wanted to change to Active Directory integration, this is where we would come. We can also set um, some parameters relating to client connections. If you're connecting server to server, which is a thing, um, if let's say my branch has a chat server and another branch has a chat server, we can actually um, link those servers together and, uh, and be able to access each other's chat rooms and things like that. Um, there's a whole bunch of options in here and uh, I'm actually not gonna go through all of them just for the sake of time. Everything should work just fine with all of these configured as default uh, because I'm doing a local non-Active Directory integrated server. So the next tab at the very, very top is users and groups. As you can see, there's only one user right now and it is me, it's the admin. Um, right here on this page, it should list all of your uh, admin, or sorry, all of your user accounts. Because we're not doing Active Directory integration, you will have to manually come in here and create every single user, which is kind of a pain and why even for small deployments, I like to Active Directory integrate, but that's entirely up to you. You can also do a user search or a, uh, an advanced search that gives you a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, flexibility with the search parameters that you use. The next sub tab here is groups. You can um, create groups uh, of people um, for the purpose of assigning permissions and things like that. Next one over is sessions. It shows you all client sessions. This is people who are actually connected to your server. Uh, if we had anybody connected, it'll give you information about them, how much receive and transmit actual data is passing between the server and them. If you have a server to server link, you can get similar information here. Moving over to the next one. Um, you can create chat rooms using the group chat tab with the room administration sub tab. I'm going to go ahead and create one just for fun. So note that uh, the room ID uh, is always going to be suffixed with the at conference dot host name, which in this case is openfire01. We're going to call this test room name will be test. The description, uh, these first three fields are mandatory. Room used for testing. You can optionally put in a topic, um, maximum number of occupants, um, and then broadcast presence for uh, visitor, participant, and moderator. Um, what that means is uh, once the room is created, if one of these types of users log into, um, or sorry, not log into, once they join, this group, it will actually announce their presence to everybody. Uh, you can also configure a password required to enter, and then um, you can show real IDs to occupants, and you can determine who's allowed to send private messages. Uh, over here on the far right, there's a whole bunch of room options. Um, you can just, they're all just check boxes, right? So if you want this room to be listed in the directory, obviously you can click that. If you wanna make the room moderated, um, Etc. etc. et, cetera, et cetera. you can do all of these things. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and just save changes. And now we can see here the room creation was successful. All of the rooms that we have will be listed here in, um, in this kind of column-based format. Um, and then now that we have a room, we can actually go in and look at more information uh, pertaining to the room including Federation, delete the room, create a new room. Okay, so I'm gonna get in here and create myself a new user, um, just kind of a dummy user for testing purposes. I'm gonna name him Calum. 
that's me. And then I have this checkbox down at the bottom that will determine whether or not this user has admin access. Uh, anybody who has admin access can log into this UI, the management UI, and do stuff. Um, I'm not going to leave that checked. I'm just going to create myself a, a dummy user for use with the chat client. Um, that's pretty much it. So now uh, I could install an XMPP client, log in with the username Calum and my configured password, and uh, in there I should be able to see the um, the test room that I had set up. Um, you may, depending on the client, you may have to actually do what's called kind of a, uh, a directory search. Um, usually if you just hit enter without specifying anything, it'll pull up all available chat rooms. I could join that one and then start chatting. Okay, I did want to make a quick note. If, uh, if anything in your setup gets messed up to the point where um, it's not correctable, there are a few things um, that it's hard to go back from. So once you select like um, embedded database versus a SQL database or an external database, um, that change is hard to, to fix. If you select uh, non-Active Directory integrated and you want to switch to Active Directory integrated, um, that can be difficult to fix without just a simple reinstall. Um, reinstalled is, uh, is actually a pretty quick process, um, pretty straightforward. You're going to go to program files like you would for any other program and, uh, and simply uninstall it. That will remove the service, uh, but will it will, what it will not do is remove the files that were installed, including all of your configuration files in the database itself. So you are going to have to manually go into um, File Explorer, into C, Program Files, and find the open file folder and delete that after you uninstall it. Um, then you should just be able to do a restart and rerun the installer and go through the initial setup process. And it's as simple as that. Now we're going to go through the initial setup again, but this time we're going to do Active Directory integration. Okay, we are back at the initial setup of OpenFire. We are going to give the ominous dominus on our language, on our host name. We are still going to use an embedded database. And this time we are going to select directory server LDAP. Again, your server does not have to be domain joined in order to participate in um, Active Directory integration. Now, um, there's a couple options here. You can use OpenLDAP or other. Um, we're going to be using Active Directory because I do have a Microsoft Active Directory infrastructure set up. Uh, and then you're going to give the server details. And uh, this is something that um, I've done this a couple of times. Um, this part, I usually forget um, exactly how to do it. I think I've remembered it this time, um, but it is going to need a base distinguished name um, for object searches, and then it's going to need um, at least a user account to enumerate Active Directory so that it can find out what users exist and what groups exist. Um, this does not have to be an administrative user. I highly suggest that you set up a service account or a, a user object specifically for OpenFire to use um, with a very, very strong password. Um, it's not going to have any special permissions or anything, uh, but for logging purposes and things like that, you will be able to audit um, you know, access to your Active Directory and it'll be using a user object that is dedicated to this function. And with that, let's get started. So I'm going to select LDAP, and then you're going to want to give it your, um, um, what do you call it? You're going to want to give it your uh, host or your domain name. For me, that is dsnet.local, and this is just the domain name that you're going to be using. And then it asks if you want to use TLS or not. Um, I'm going to opt with no. And then here for base DN, you need to specify the search um, 
search space that you're going to be using or that OpenFire is going to be using to look for objects and things. And this does need to be in distinguished name format. So I'm going to do OU equals DSNet, comma, DC equals DSNet, comma, DC equals local. And that should fit that. So uh, I have DSNet.local. And then the OU is the, I kind of have an OU set up at the root of my uh, domain here that has all of my objects and whatnot inside of it. Okay, the next step is going to set up the administrator DN. So who is going to be the um, admin account that you're going to use to log in here um, in the future? This DN does have to be in um, a certain format, right? It's going to be the um, canonical name, if you will. Um, so it's going to start with CN, and then uh, you're going to list a username, and you have to basically specify the full path to that username. So I have already grabbed that information. Uh, if you go into Active Directory and you right-click on a user, you can actually open up um, the properties, and it will list for you the full DN of that user. So the easiest way to make sure this does not get messed up is to just copy and paste that in here, which I'm about to do. So I've copied my uh, DN into a text file and then dropped it into my demo share uh, so that I can access it from my OpenFire server. As you can see, I'm using my domain admin account um, it's set up on my demo network. Um, you would want to use just a regular user account um, or an open fire admin account or something like that, some sort of a service account that's only going to be used um, by open fire for the purposes of managing open fire. Okay. So I've copied that onto my clipboard. Minimize that. And I'm going to paste that admin DN in there. Okay. Now, if I remember, oh, I copied that, or I pasted it twice. Let's try that one more time. Okay, so um, if I remember correctly, these um, any special characters need to be escaped, um, or at least that's what I remember from my previous installs. Um, I'm going to go with it just to see what it does. Uh, I don't know if this version has fixed that issue or not. And then you're going to need the password for that actual user account so that it can actually get into Active Directory and enumerate all the objects in there. So we're going to click Test Settings. OK, I hit Test Settings, and it doesn't actually say that it failed or anything. So it's a good thing, I think. Um, there's a whole bunch of advanced settings, too, down here. Um, I usually leave everything as default. And let's hit Save and Continue. Okay, it appears that uh, that, that worked. We don't have to escape those parentheses or anything like that. Um, okay, so the next page it's going to go to is ask you what the username field that OpenFire should use. Um, we're going to use damn account name. You could pick any attribute um, that you want from Active Directory. As a, as a display, and we're going to click Save and Continue. This next part uh, configures how the server finds and loads groups from Active Directory. Um, the group field is going to be the CN, the member field, member. I leave all this as default every time. We're going to click Save and Continue, and then we're going to add Administrator. So what account? do you want to be an administrator on OpenFire? Um, I'm pretty sure it already adds the default one. I'm not actually, not Calum.cassette. Calum. Okay, 
So it has added uh, my user account as an administrator. Um, we're going to test it. It looks like we have no errors, so that's good. And we're going to continue. Okay, setup is now complete. Uh, we're going to go to the admin console and see if we can log in with my account. Alright, it's really thinking hard, and there we have it. I was able to log in with my Active Directory credential. Um, if we go to Users and Groups, as you can see, everybody who has an account on my Active Directory server already has an account now in um, my OpenFire server. Um, and then all the groups should enumerate as well. Um, you can see I have had some fun in my test environment. <laughs> I have a group called Grounded Kids, so when my kids are naughty, I can drop them in there and they automatically lose access to a whole bunch of fun stuff. Um, certain apps they can't launch. Um, I might do another video on that if, if there is interest. If you're interested in that, uh, drop a comment down below and I'll uh, throw up a video on how to have some fun with permissions. Um, and that's pretty much it. So now we have an Active Directory integrated server anybody who has an active directory integrated account will be able to log in using an xmpp chat client without having to create a special username for that purpose um, i'm going to go a real quick and create a new group actually no not a group sorry i'm going to be creating a new chat room so that we can use that during the next video that will be on configuring the chat client, specifically the Spark client. Okay, now that's all set up. I hope the, this video was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them in a comment uh, down in the box below. Please like and subscribe this video if it was if you found it helpful at all. And uh, if you have any other ideas or requests for videos, walkthroughs, or explanations. Uh, drop that in the comments as well, and I will be more than happy to do a video uh, to answer your question. Thank you for your time, and have a blessed day.